Well, hey everyone, and welcome to Central at Home. And no matter where you're watching or how you're watching, we're so honored that you've decided to spend the next 45 minutes or so with us today. Now, if you're being impacted by these experiences, why don't you take a moment right now and share this on whatever platform that you're watching. Again, our heartbeat every week is to see as many people as possible impacted with this life-transforming message. And this is one of the easiest and most effective ways to reach new people and spread the word about this amazing community of faith. You know, as a church, we've been learning the power of connection and how important it is to our faith. And so connection with God and connection with each other are a big part of that. And so as a church, we're here to help you do just that. First off today, I wanna to challenge you to really personally connect with God. Open your heart to feel His presence as we worship together. Open your mind to challenge your thoughts through some of the teaching and the discussion questions after the experience. And open your soul to connect with God. Also today, if you'd like to worship through your giving and make sure that no one misses out on being a part of this amazing faith community here at Central, the easiest way to do that is by heading over to our website, centralcc.ca slash give, and you can follow the prompts. You can schedule a one-time gift or set up regular ongoing giving. Either way, everything that we do happens because of your generosity. And so we do wanna thank you in advance for your generosity. As a side note, we did wanna give you a bit of a financial update. As of the end of May, we are at about 85% of our 12-month ministry year budget. And year over year, we're up about $80,000, which is amazing from last year. And so we do wanna thank you for being the generous church that you are. And we just wanna ask that you continue in your faithfulness in this way as we just believe generosity is the way of Jesus. And together, we get the privilege of partnering to make sure that nobody misses out on this life-transforming message. Also, we wanna help you connect with others. And there are a few opportunities that you can take advantage of to do that. The first one is groups. And we have groups for all ages, all demographics, all interests available for you. And I wanna mention a couple of them right now. If you're watching during our broadcast times of 9 or 10.30 a.m., we've been having an amazing time sticking around after these experiences for a group called Virtual Coffee Connections. And so you can jump into our Zoom discussion for about 45 minutes where we engage with the message and we spend some time praying together and growing in our spiritual journeys. Lastly, we're officially back in person on Sundays, and so we'd love for you to join us for one of our in-person experiences at either 9, 10, 30, or 12. You do need to pre-register for those in advance, and so if you want more information about that, just simply follow the prompts on the screen. If you have any questions today on how you can get connected, simply head over to our website, centralcc.ca slash connect, or text the word central to 905-937-5610. So that's all from me. The moment you're waiting for is finally here. Our experience is about to begin and it all starts right now. Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us online. We're so excited to sing a couple songs, so please join along and sing along with us. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out Working all things out Yes, I will I will bless your name. 
Beautiful name.
about two years ago um, this month, my daughter, Grace, was very sick. Um, she was really tiny and not gaining weight and throwing up all the time, and we had no idea what was wrong. And in the midst of all of that, I also found myself in a really bad, dark place, and it was just a really bad time for my family. And it kind of climaxed in Grace being in the hospital. We were admitted to McMaster for a few nights. And it's a really tough time when your child's sick, and the second night in the hospital, I was sleeping there with her, and she was in a crib, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I woke up, and all of the lights in my hospital room were on, and I could see my daughter still asleep, and I thought, this is strange. So I kind of looked around to try and figure out what was happening, and I looked up at the ceiling, and I saw this black web come down and drape itself over her crib, and I watched it make its way over to the chair of the recliner that I was sitting in and drape its arm onto my leg. And I remember being paralyzed with fear. I've never been that scared in my whole life. And my first thought was, I need to get out of here. And I couldn't move, I couldn't breathe, I couldn't call for help. And all I could do in that moment was just say, Jesus. And I said it so quietly, and it was like I couldn't get out anything more than that. And so I said it again and again, and I think I ended up saying it a good six times as I watched this black thing pull off of my daughter's crib and go back into the ceiling and disappear. And I remember sitting in my chair, still feeling shocked at what I had just witnessed, but also feeling this sense of victory. And I know what that thing was, and I know that it doesn't want my daughter to be here, but she is here, and she will be. And that's because we serve a God who is victorious, and nothing can stand against His powerful name. And I want to encourage you today with that story, not scare you, but encourage you that in a time where I think we could all use a little bit more peace or calm or reassurance, that that's all you have to say. You don't need a special churchy prayer or fancy words or to even be in the building, but just to be able to say the name Jesus and he comes rushing in. He's not a mean parent who barges in without being asked. He'll always wait, but he's always waiting. He wants you to ask. So I wanna encourage you that when you're done listening to the message today, why don't you try that if you feel like you need more peace or calm in your life? Just take a moment alone to ask and just say, Jesus, Jesus, just come and he will, because that's who he is. Why don't you close your eyes and pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God who is in control, that you are a God who is beautiful and wonderful and at the same time all powerful that you stand undefeated, that you do not have a rival, and there is no one who equals you. And we're thankful that you choose us and you choose to love us and welcome us into relationship with you. Thank you that we can claim that power as our own and that you want to give it to us. You want to stand with us in the times where we need you. And so I pray that who's ever listening to this, wherever this, this prayer falls, that wherever those people are sitting or driving or working, that they would feel instant calm and instant peace in their life, that it would fill up their soul and bring them home again to you. Thank you for who you are. And thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. are a hypocrite. I actually remember the very first time those words were leveled at me. I remember the location. I remember the face of the person who said it. 
I remember the churning in my stomach, the flash of anger on the back of my neck, my desire to either run away or punch him in the face. But I remember the worst part of it all was, it was true. He was right. I was being a hypocrite. Now, this word often is used in reference to Christians, but I just want to encourage you. I don't know if it's encouraging or not, but this is not reserved only for followers of Jesus. As a matter of fact, all of us in some way are hypocrites. I mean, there are nutritionalists who are unhealthy. There are financial advisors who are broke. There are environmentalists who drink with plastic bottles, right? There are socialists who live in luxury. There are activists who even have underwear that was made in a sweatshop. We all in some level are a hypocrite because that word in the Greek simply means to have a contradiction between what you say and what you do. And the reality is it's in you and it's in me. So in the book of James, James is so frustrated. He is fed up with it and it comes through in his book. And if we're honest, we are too. So here's what he says in James chapter two. He says, what good is it? My brothers and sisters, you can hear the angst there, right? If someone claims to have faith, but has no deeds, can such faith save them? I think the point he's trying to make is our faith is supposed to change us. Our faith is supposed to be active in such a way that we are actually different. And so this whole series for the next few weeks in James are about a faith that works. And I started with this question last week. Does Christianity really work anymore? Is it still valid? And so last week we talked about the fact that, yes, it is when we act, but according to what we say we believe. And so we talked about suffering last week, but today James is gonna lean into how we treat people. And so I hope you're not too sensitive, okay? If you need to go get you know an antacid to get ready for this, you need to prep yourself with an ice pack, whatever you need to do, because we're just gonna go deep into what James, the brother of Jesus, says we need to do in order to make our faith work. So in chapter, chapter one, verse 26, he talks about the way we speak and our words. And we're going to actually talk a lot about that next week. But in chapter two, verses one and four, he talks about discrimination, that you shouldn't treat people based on how much money they have or whether you like them or not. And then in verses 15 and 16 in chapter two, he talks about indifference, about, you know, saying to someone, oh yeah, go in peace when they're in need, but not doing anything about it. He says, this should not happen. And he, and he summarizes all of these analogies, all of these examples in chapter two, verse 26, where he says, as the body without the spirit is dead. So when you die, your spirit leaves you. In the same way, faith without works or deeds is dead. So James is really leaning into this reality that it's not what you say that matters. It's what you do to back up what you say that matters. I mean, think about it this way, right? So you go to the bank and um, they say, yeah, we're gonna, if you give us your money, with us, we're going to give you some interest. And then you show up a month later and actually you've got less money in the bank. And you're like, no, 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 you said this, right? We get frustrated with that. Or imagine um, you go to a surgeon and they say, yeah, we're going to you know, remove a, a little assist on your earlobe and they cut off your leg. You're like, wait, no, no, that's not what you said you were going to do. And, and we know this in relationships too, right? Don't tell me you love me. Like at some point that doesn't mean anything anymore right? We all know this. And yet it's really hard to do. And so what James is saying, look, brothers and sisters, followers of Jesus, let's stop talking about what we believe and let's actually start leaning in and acting what we believe. And that's hard, isn't it? Because can we just be transparent? Um, there's lots of times I don't act according to what I say, I believe. So what evidence is in, in, in these change? I mean, if actions are louder than words, if that's true, and if James is right that our works and our beliefs are synonymous, what evidence should be in our life? What should that look like? What are these deeds he's talking about? That's a great question. So I think he's thinking about his brother Jesus. And Jesus, when asked, what is the greatest commandment? Like if I could only do one thing right, what would that be? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, everything else, like 
everything you say you believe, okay, everything you've read, everything you were taught in Sunday school, everything you've preached about, right, hangs on that. Like, if you don't get that right, none of it's right. And so James in chapter two, verse eight says, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing what is right. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. What is this law? It's the law of love. Literally, it'll be a litmus test. How much did you love? How much did it motivate what you said? How much did it motivate what you did? Well, how much did it motivate what you posted? The law of love, mercy triumphs over judgment. So I think James is saying, look, I'm hearing a lot of you talk. I see you flapping your gums. I see you preaching on the internet, you know, through every, every social media platform you've got. But I don't see a lot of love. I don't see it. And it makes him frustrated and makes us frustrated too. That's what a hypocrite is, according to James. So he's saying this is the, love is this active ingredient. I, I was thinking about bread. I don't know about, about you, but I love bread. Like I, I know I probably shouldn't love it as much as I do, but I love bread, especially fresh bread out of the oven. Oh, I know you're hungry now, right? Okay, go get, pause, go get some bread, come back. Anyway, the point is this. In bread, there is an active ingredient. It's called yeast. And yeast is a microorganism that when activated actually produces CO2, carbon dioxide, believe it or not, and it creates, it creates these bubbles, which makes the bread expand, get fluffy, gets just so delicious, all of that smell wafting through. Oh, I, I, sorry, I gotta eat something right now, but, but here's the point. Without that active ingredient, bread is flat. Now, I'm not against flat bread, but not when you want fluffy white bread. I mean, come on, right? Am I right? And in the same way, what James is saying is that if you don't have love, your faith is flat. You can say what you want. You can believe you're right all you want. You can thump this all you want. But if you don't have love, you're missing the active ingredient. See, I think it's, it's what you really believe about God as it translates to how you treat people. Here's what he's saying. Yeah, believe what you want about God. That's awesome. God is love. It's true. But it only applies as you translate to how you treat other people. It's got to do that. So am I a hypocrite? In the Greek, that means an actor playing a role, an actor behind a mask. Yes, I am. And so are you. But, but it's okay because you don't have to stay there. You see, the cool thing about this Greek word that we translate into English as hypocrite actually has a positive element. It's an invitation to change. In Romans 12, 9, we read these words from Paul. Let love be without hypocrisy. He's saying, yeah, look, it's okay to admit and acknowledge that you're not who you should be, but don't stay there. This is an invitation back into the life-transforming truth that love wins. And it's an invitation back into change. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. See, here's, here's what I, I wrote in my journal. In the positive, it means to be sincere, authentic, real, to be who you really want to be and to do what you really want to do. James says it this way in chapter one, verse 22. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. I actually had an awkward experience that way this week. I went onto a Zoom call and I had not looked in the mirror. Not a good call. Anyway, his point is, whoever looks intently into the perfect law, the law of love that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Okay, so I had this really radical idea. Okay, you ready? Um, and again, Email me if you don't agree. That's fine, because you are going to anyway. But here's what, here's what I thought. Any action devoid of love is inaccurate as a follower of Jesus. And any action, even if it's not perfect, filled with love, is the right way to go. That is awesome. And so what is the purpose of following Jesus? 
I, I think many of us as followers of Jesus today in our Western civilization think it's actually creating great arguments to support our worldview. Like let's get all our ducks in a row and dot all our I's and cross all our T's and, and, and make sure that we present ourselves well so people will believe that we are right. I don't think that's it. I think there's another view that says, you know, I, I've, I've got this exclusive right to insider information. Like we're the special few and we've got the truth and all the other poor suckers in the world are just, well, too bad for them. And, and we got to help those poor suckers out because we know and they don't. We're right, they're wrong. I don't think there's a lot of love in either of those positions. I actually think the reason that I follow Jesus is because he motivates me to change. He, he demonstrates what love really looks like in his words and his actions. And I want to be like that. He motivates me to change. It's it's not enough just to think about it, to believe it, to sing about it, to talk about it. No, it has to motivate me. I have to be more loving today than I was yesterday. And I better be more loving today than I was 30 years ago. Because if I'm not, the active ingredient isn't working. And I'm being a hypocrite. And so Jesus invites me to pull away the mask. Jesus invites me to take away the pretense and what I think is right and what I want and what I think should happen and and my religious attitudes. And he, he allows me to strip it away and to be real and authentic, to not always get it right. It's not about getting it right, but to always be loving in everything I say and everything I do. See, I just need you to know something. I follow Jesus because I need to change. I follow Jesus Because I need him. Because on my own, I am not loving. On my own, I hurt people. On my own, I don't see others as equal to me. On my own, I try to get what I need for me, what's best for Bill, self. But Jesus motivates me to always think about others. And so I think what James is saying in this chapter, a faith that works, is a faith that changes you. And in changing you, it changes others because of how you treat them. See, once you really believe that you are loved, there's no reason why you should not freely love others. So, is Jesus the only way? For me, he is. You you can decide for yourself, but for me, he is. And so I just want to close with a couple questions. Has your faith really changed you? In what way? Would you make the argument that you are more loving today than you were yesterday, maybe even more challenging with the people around you. Say, you're more loving today because of your faith. I think this is what James is talking about. So decide what you really believe and act accordingly. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, what a great message from Pastor Bill today. And I really wanna encourage you to take a few moments right now or maybe even later this week just to reflect on what it is that God's speaking to you and what he's reminding you of and to respond accordingly. And we'd love to help you and to challenge you to take your next step today with God and with others. And there's a few ways that you could do that here at Central. The first one is if you made a decision today to follow Jesus, we'd love to celebrate with you as we honestly can't think of a better decision that you could have ever made. So we'd love to help you with that and help you on that journey if we can. And so if you made that decision, simply text the word CENTRAL to 905-937-5610 and we'll follow up with you later this week. And again, if you are watching during our broadcast times of 9 or 10.30 a.m., we'd love for you to stick around after this experience for a group called Virtual Coffee Connections. And so you can jump in to our Zoom discussion for about 45 minutes where we engage with the message, spend some time praying and growing together in our spiritual journeys. If you have any questions on how to get connected, simply head over to centralcc.ca slash connect or text the word central to 905-937-5610 and you'll find everything you need to know on how to get connected. Well, that's all from me. I hope you have an amazing week and we'll see you back here next week.